Soup presents Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Boris Scala. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door into the land of ghosts, vampires, and other gay, hilarious people. Friends, are you looking for an apartment? Well, we have just the place for you. It's sturdily built, completely of marble, with cold running water every time it rains. You don't have to worry about the landlord putting you out. The lease is forever. All you have to do to get this little love nest is call your undertaker and get yourself a little bit dead. <laughs> Mr. Host, I assure you, no one is the least bit interested in your offer. But, Mary, just think. Once you're dead, you can appear on Inner Sanctum. You know, we always have a ghost in our story, someone whose voice comes back from the grave and gives advice to our characters. Yeah, sometimes I think our theme song should be, My Mummy Done Told Me. <laughs> well, that's very funny. <laughs> but you know, Mr. Host, talking about voices coming back, that's what happened to me the other day. I heard my own voice coming back to me on the radio while I was eating breakfast. No. Yes. I just heard the new Lipton jingle, and then I heard myself. Yes, there I was, talking about Inner Sanctum and about Lipton tea, too. Mm. You see, it was a record, uh, an electrical transcription that I'd made, all about Lipton's brisk flavor, how Lipton's always tastes fresh and full-bodied, never wishy-washy. And you know what? There was a man on the record who talked almost like you, Mr. Host. An imposter. I'll kill him. Oh, it was just in fun. <laughs> he made spooky remarks when I talked about Lipton tea. <laughs> but I did get a chance to say that Lipton's is the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world. All right, Mary, you've had your chance. And now make room for the creepiest voice you ever heard. The curdling kid himself, the star of stage, screen, and radio, Boris Karloff. Tonight's story is called The Wailing War. It's an original radio play by Milton Lewis. You'll hear Boris Karloff in the role of Gabriel Hornell. All set, friend. And turn out the lights, curdle close to the fire, and listen. Night. And on the waterfront of downtown Manhattan, the fog creeps in like a crawling cloud. Tucked in between the towering skyscrapers, there's an old rundown mansion. An anachronism. A freak among the streamlined giants. It's the Hornell home. And tonight, leaping tongues of flame from behind the black shutters. There's it, Johnny. Is there anybody in that old dump? There's an old guy there, there, don't you? Gabriel Hornet. There'll be a chance enough to get out. That place is like a tinderbox. Yeah, pretty well gone. Hold it. Get that hole. Hey, there is someone in there. Get the axe. Come on. I'm right behind you. Watch. Get out of the way. Hurry, will you? Knock the door. All right, come on in. You see anyone in there? No, we can't see. Hey, there he is. Oh, the crazy coot didn't even have sense enough to get out. on the 18th floor. Gabriel Hornell is not in his room. The window is open from the bottom. Yes, I'm sure he did. There's a letter. I know, but I'm sure he's not alive. Oh, the, the letter? Yes, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, to whom it may concern. By the time, By the time you, you read, read this, this, I shall I be dead. Be there can be no mistake this time. Death holds no fear, no terror any greater than what I've endured in life. For the past 40 years, I've searched for freedom. I hope now I've found it. Even now, as I write, I can hear her voice. 
calling to me as she did that night years ago. I prepared everything while she was in bed. Just the last few minute little details had to be complete. Gabriel! Gabriel, do you hear me? What do you want? What are you doing down there? I'm... I'm fixing something. Well, why don't you come up? I don't want to be alone here. I can't bear to be alone. Come up, Gabriel. What's the matter with you? Why don't you answer me? Oh, you're just doing it for spite. I know you are. Stop that hammering, Gabriel. You know I can't bear that noise? Now stop it, please. Gabriel, will you stop that noise? Oh. You came down. Well, of course I came down. Did you expect me to lie there while all this racket was going on? Now, you know I'm a sick woman, Gabriel. What are you doing there, anyhow? You can see. Well, yes, I can see, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, you've made a huge gaping hole in the wall. Now, what on earth did you want to do a thing like that for? You'll find out soon enough. And, and what are all those things? Stonemason's tools, cement, plaster. Well, I never dreamed you knew how to use them. Oh, I'm going back to bed. No, Agnes. No? No. Gabriel, that rope in your hand. Yes. I thought carefully about this rope, Agnes. It's the most merciful way. It leaves a little trace since there's no blood. Gabriel. You won't make it difficult, will you, Agnes? Murder. It's the only way. No, Gabriel. We couldn't go on like this. Your imaginary illnesses, your constant nagging. I, I have to be free of them, Agnes. But murder? This is best for both of us. No, Gabriel. Send me away. Do anything you want. You can get a divorce. A divorce there, see? That would solve everything. You could have your freedom. Stand there, Agnes. Just as you are. I know. That other woman, Dorothy Carter, that actress. That's why you're doing this. Oh, you thought I didn't know about that, Gabriel. Well, I do. Yes, I do. No. Let go of me again. That rope. Help me, somebody. It will be done in a minute. Done? No. You'll never be free of me. As long as you live. Yes. The cat saw everything with its yellow eyes. The cat saw me take her body to the tomb I'd made in the wall. The cat saw me place her there and carefully seal it up. I work quickly, skillfully, with infinite care. First the bricks, one on top of the other, then the plaster. Then the wallpaper to match the rest of the room. That wasn't very difficult. In a short time, it was done. I was free. All I had to do now was to go to the police and report her missing. It was even simpler than I thought. I put on the coat. I was about to open the front door when I heard it for the first time. I thought it must be my imagination. I listened carefully. I rushed to the wall, put my ear to it. What I heard made icy perspiration ooze out of every pore of my body. The wail was coming from the wall. It was like the insane shriek of some creature of another world. Was she alive in there? She couldn't be. She was dead. I knew she was dead. And yet I heard her voice wailing. I could swear it was her voice. I couldn't go out as I planned. What if someone else should hear it? Would they go to the wall? Investigate? The doorbell. Oh, it couldn't be at this hour. It couldn't be. But, but it was. Who? Oh. Oh, I, I had to risk everything and answer it. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Arnett. It was Patrolman Cleary. He was the officer on the beat. He was blue with cold. I was passing by and I saw the lights on. I peeked in the window. You... You looked in? Yes. Since you were still up, I thought I'd ring. It's a bit of cold out tonight and I'd like to warm his old bones for a minute. Well, Oh, yes, yes, of course, Cleary. Don't stand there in the door, man. Come in, come in. Thank you. I see you got your coat on, Mr. Turner. Just got in? Only, only a few moments ago. As a matter of fact, I, I was going to see you. You mean? Why, yes. It's, it's about my wife. Hi, right, something wrong? I, I hope not. I was out all evening. When I got home, she was gone. It's not like her, Mr. Turner. No, it, it isn't. 
Is she alone, Our Lady? Yes, I, at least I think she was. You know, she hasn't been feeling very well lately, and I... Why, oh, I, I hate to think it possible, but... But she may have destroyed herself. Mrs. Arnell? No. She wasn't a sort. Oh, she was ill. Terribly ill. I tried to keep it secret until she recovered. But the doctors knew. And then? Yeah. Don't you see? The river. I'd better get back to the precinct and report this. You'd better come with me. The missing persons bureau will... Hey. Mr. Arnell. Yes? You must be mistaken. Isn't that her? That... That isn't a woman. Of course it is. She's coming from that room there. Well, sure, it's your wife. I know her voice and she sounds like she's in pain. But it can't be. There's no one in that room. She must have come in the back way. Come, I'll show you. No, don't go in. Huh? Nothing. No. There. You can see for yourself there's no one here. No one. Could have sworn your wife was in this room. <laughs> How'd you like to live in a house with wailing walls? Well, one thing you have to admit, things aren't so very dead in the Hornell Mansion. Or are they? Well, <laughs> all I can say is I'm glad I don't have to live in that house with that awful wailing. Why, Mary, there's a wailing, whistling kind of noise in your house, too. The first time I heard it, I was so scared, I shivered in my shroud. What? Oh, you're talking about my whistling tea kettle. Oh, goodness, there's nothing scary about that. Now, as you'd only try Lipton tea with its wonderful brisk flavor, that whistle would sound as cheery to you as birds whistling in the morning. Especially on these chilly mornings when a cup of Lipton's just makes you feel like the sun was shining inside of you. And folks, if you want a sunny disposition, you should try relaxing with a cup of Lipton tea after a hard job like, well, maybe washing out your window curtains. Yes, and what's more, you can help your friends feel right with the world, too, by serving them Lipton tea when they come to visit you. Mm, Lipton's always taste so tangy and heartwarming, never flat or wishy-washy. Yes, that brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world. All right, friends, we've given you a chance to warm your blood, and now we fondly hope to turn it to ice again. With the help of our star, Boris Karloff. Oh, let's hear the second act of Inner Sanctum. We continue with the strange letter left by Gabriel Hornell. Here he was, in silent fascination as the cat screamed and leaped against the wall. Would he notice the new wallpaper in the dim light? Suddenly, the policeman turned to me. Yes, I... I guess that noise is only the wind. Strange, I like a wailing woman it can sound, isn't it? Yes. Well, I'm believing now. I guess it'll be all right for you to stay here. I'll make a report at headquarters about your wife. It's very good of you, Carrie. She turns up, you let us know? Yes, I, I'll let you know. Good night, Mr. O'Neill. Good night. He left. I locked the door and came back to the room. The room where my wife was entombed. Was she still alive inside the hollow of that wall? I listened all that night. The wailing rose to a high, insane shriek. And then towards morning, it began to grow weaker. And so she was losing strength. And it seemed to die. The cat crept away. There was a merciful silence in the house. She was dead. She had to be by now. I sat down onto the sofa into a feverish sleep. <laughs> Somewhere a bell was tolling, calling the mourners to the grave. Suddenly I sat both upright, shaking, trembling. Oh, I'd been dreaming. The front doorbell was ringing. It was night again. How long had I slept? The house was silent. Oh, there was nothing to fear now. I ran to the door, opened it. Hi, kiddo. Daughter. Well, are you going to keep me out here in the cold? No, no. Come in. Come in. I, I haven't been... haven't been feeling well, darling. Is that why you forgot our date tonight? I, I must have overslept. What time is it? Ten o'clock. Ten? I must have slept clear through the day. 
Well? Aren't you glad to see me? Glad? Why, oh, yes, it's a, it's a delightful surprise. Well, that's more like you. Come here, kiddo. You've got the blues, but Doris here wipe them away. Give us a kiss. What? What's that? Just, just the wind. Oh, no, it can't be the wind. This is a very old house, Dorothy. You sometimes hear strange noises. Oh, I've never heard anything like that before. Sounds human. Oh, oh she's still alive. Even after 24 hours, suddenly I realize that the doorbell is ringing again. There was a large pair of wooden sliding panel doors between the room that we were in and the vestibule that led to the street. I wasn't going to take any more chances. There's someone at the door, Gabe. Yes. You wait here, Dorothy. What are you doing? Closing these doors. Why? I'd advise you not to ask too many questions. Evening, Mr. O'Neill. Officer Cleary. Who are those men with you? They... That's something to show you, Mr. O'Neill. You'd better brace yourself. It's not going to be pleasant. All right, bring it in, boys. You can put it over there. What? What is it? It's a... body. A woman. Just fished out of the river right near here. She can't be dead more than 24 hours. My wife? That's hard to say. You see, the body got caught in the propeller of a boat. It's not easy to recognize it. Unless it was examined by someone who knew her very well. Like yourself, of course. Let me see it. Take away the burner. Look, Miss Dunham. I know. It's pretty bad. Is... Is it your wife? Agnes? Yes. Yes, of course. It's... It's her. You're sure now? Yes, I... I'm sure. Positive. All right, boys. Take it away. You can stay here, Mr. Arnett. I'll take care of everything down at headquarters. Good night. Good night, Cleary. Luck, fate, whatever it is that seemed to control men's lives was playing directly into my hands. They never investigate now. The nightmare was over. This time I was really free. Suddenly, the panel door opened. Dorothy was standing there. A curious smile on her lips. I heard everything, kiddo. You did? So you were married. No longer, Dorothy. My wife died. Suicide. So I heard. Now everything will be quite all right and we can get married in a few weeks. We'll have money, lots of money. You left you plenty, eh? She was very wealthy. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> I see what happens to your face when you hear that wail. Did you kill her? What are you talking about? Did you murder her? You heard what he said. She was found in the river. You can fool a dumb copper, but you can't fool Dorothy. That wail. It's queer. Awful. Look at what that cat's doing, will you? Jumping up on that wall like it's gone crazy. Yes, there's something about that wall. That's what the cat's trying to tell me. Something about the wall. You better must stay away from that, Oliver. I'm going to find out. Yeah, but don't look in down. Not till I'm done with it, kiddo. What are you doing there? I'm going to break it through that wall. You crazy fool, stop it. No. Yes. Give me that thing. You're too late, Gabe. I've broken a hole through and I'm going to look. Yeah. Now you've seen. Yes. It's a hand. The hand of a woman. Her. Your wife. Yes, Dorothy. You murdered her. Yes. Well, ain't you the chief? What are you going to do about it? What do you think? I want money. Lots of... That... That rope. Yes. This rope. <sighs> it leaves no telltale traces. Oh, no, no, kid. D didn't you get it? It was all a joke. No, don't come any closer. Don't scream, Dorothy. It won't do you any good. Yes, listen to me. I, I don't want to say not, not one penny. I love you. I love you, I tell you. I, I'll keep your secret. I'll do anything you want. Anything. Now, that rope. Take it away from my neck. Don't give it to me. Don't, 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 don't,
thing that I was certain of. I must never leave the house, not even for a minute. I never did. At night, I would sit there, listening. Then it would come, the wail in the wall. I knew that after a week, she couldn't be alive. What made the wail? Plans? I, I thought of a thousand plans, but all of them would mean that I had to leave the house, and if I left, Someone would hear the wail and find out, just as Dorothy did. Fire. Yes, fire. That would do it. The idea danced like a flame in my mind. But no, no. They discovered charred bones of the skeletons among the wreckage. No, it, it wouldn't be worth it. The only way I could be safe was to stay there in the house. I stayed. I, who had risked everything for freedom. One day, the doorbell tinkled. I opened it. Mr. Hornell? Yes. I'm Mr. Crawford from the bank. May I come in? Just in here, in the vestibule. We've written to you a dozen times, but you've never replied. What do you want? Well, Mr. Hornell, you may not realize it, but you've overdrawn your account. The money your wife left is gone. Gone? So short a time? So short? Why, she died 40 years ago. 40? It seems only yesterday. We've been investigating... Even the grocer who used to supply your food no longer will extend you credit. Well, what do you want with me? I'm not starving. If you'd see your face, you'd realize that you are, Mr. Hornell. Now, if you'll only be reasonable, we can see to it that you get $250,000. A, a quarter of a million? How? By selling this house, it's become very valuable. No. no. You get out of here. Get out. But, Mr. Hornell... Get out! Very well. He was right. I was starving. That night, when I heard the wailing begin again, I came to a decision. I, I had spent 40 years in the house. More punishment than criminals receive who've committed even worse crimes than mine. I'd take a chance. I opened the wall I'd sealed up 40 years ago. She, she was still there. But the wailing continued. Why, why? I looked into the tomb I made for her, and then I saw it. I saw this thing that had ruined my life. It was a tiny hole in the outside wall that I'd made when I first broke it open. The wind rushed through and made that horrible wail. Ah, what was the use? I took a match out of my pocket. I set its flame to the curtains. In a moment, the place would be an inferno. But I decided to stay. I wanted to perish with the house. In death, at least I did for it. the nurse make inquiries from the police. She told me. No, there was nothing unusual found among the ashes. Everything was burned to a fine powder. If, if I had only set fire to the house 40 years ago. But no matter. The window is open. And it's 18 stories to the ground. I will soon be free. Everybody's dead but the cat. We overlooked him because we couldn't find him. Of course, I'm sorry. 
But that wall made such an unpleasant noise, such a tuneless wailing. We tried to teach her to whistle the new Lipton tea jingle, but we didn't have time, eh, Mary? <laughs> now, you just stop teasing me, because I'm not going to talk about the Lipton jingle now. No, and I'm not going to talk about Lipton tea either. Instead, the Lipton people want me to remind you folks about something important. I mean the Victory Loan Drive. You know, friends, we've been buying bonds for many years now. But this drive is in some ways the most important. Because if a job is worth doing, then it's worth finishing. The bonds you buy now won't buy weapons. No, this time the money will help bring our boys home. It will also help take care of our wounded soldiers. Provide them with the finest medical care in the world. And friends, we can certainly do no less. And the victory bond you buy now will help launch our veterans into a safe and secure post-war world. The kind of world they've been fighting for. Yes, you're helping others and yourself, too, every time you buy a victory bond. So buy all you can, won't you? All right, friends. Until we meet at some haunted house, here's a parting thought. Don't seal your wife in a wall. That won't keep her quiet. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's inner sanctum mystery novel is Devil in the Bush by Matthew Head. Yes, and next week's inner sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a man who gets hunches. His hunches are about death. He's sure he's going to be killed. Not by poison or fire or strangling. Nothing simple like that. No, our character has a nice, interesting death waiting for him. Oh, if you'd like to be in at the death, drop in next Tuesday. <laughs> and now it's time to close the squeaking door, so good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm? <laughs>